have lots of stories to share with you over time because God did some amazing things in and through us. And, and as I mentioned last week, I don't know how many of you weren't here, but uh, God can use you wherever you wherever you go, wherever you are. God can use you as long as you make yourself available. I have an amazing story. I'm going to follow up uh, with the results of this later. But I, I talked to you last week how God used us uh, with this Hindu woman. Uh, she was a she, we walked into the store and we were talking with her and just opened up a beautiful conversation and, and she just she wanted to tell us something but she wanted to say it when her manager wasn't around and we're like okay um, so she kind of just quietly and as soon as he left she said you guys are Christians right and we said yeah yeah we're, we're Christians and she goes on 777 I accepted Jesus into my heart now, she was a Hindu woman, and her an entire family was Hindu, and she was afraid to tell anybody in her family her commitment she made, but she wanted to tell us that she made this commitment. Now, she, had, she hasn't had any growth, she hasn't had any uh, uh, discipleship, none of those things have happened, and so we just had a really good time to, to speak into her life and to tell her, hey, th- these are some things that God has in store for you, and we, we just had a great conversation with her. Uh, some thing, weird things happened in the store. Like we, we spent a lot of time in there, and in the end, they couldn't do what we wanted them to do, which is unbelievable. Uh, we weren't asking for anything amazing or diff- anything difficult, but they just couldn't do it. And we're like, what is with this? So we went to another store, and we were asking them, and this guy, we started talking, he said, well, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a pastor. He goes, oh, really? And he got just totally excited. He said, well, we're, we're starting a Bible study tonight. Can you come to it? And I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I can do that. I've already had my kids sitting in stores for the last three hours. If I tell them we're not going to do anything tonight as a family, um, they'll probably kill me. So, uh, but we just want to encourage him, and, and we were talking to him, and then we got on the subject just telling about the um this lady back in this other store and he goes well yeah i know who you're talking about i know her and we're like what he goes well it was my wife that led her to, to christ and i'm like wow i said you know who you need to invite to your home group that you're starting it, it's her she's the one who has to be there because he was telling us how he would do this home group the church inside a house so people would not think it's going to a church or a building it was a home group that, that they could go and they wouldn't be threatened by their family because they're just going to someone else and I said yeah that's who so it was just so neat how God took us from Canada to St. Martin so he could reconnect one person to another person who they led him to the her look to the Lord like almost nine years ago and this was now their opportunity to start discipling and doing that so uh, it's just such a cool thing that God allows us to be used in those ways. And, and it's nothing miraculous. We did not see a light. We didn't see a sign above their heads. All we did is start a conversation with them. And God directed the conversation. God led us to where we could impact them, make a need known and fulfilled. And it was just a really good time. So uh, I just want to encourage you, be open to that. Just be talking to people. And... Um, you you find out that God will use you in, in very powerful ways, uh, and, and we're going to see that in the next little bit. Well, that's a very long introduction, so we're going to continue where we left off about a month ago. Anybody remember where we were? The Lord's Prayer. Good thing you remembered. I had to look it up again. Matthew 6 beginning in verses 9 to 13, it says, Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So uh, for those of you who keep notes, you might remember, uh, we ended off last time with the importance of forgiveness. The importance that we need to forgive in order to be forgiven. We like to say God's love is, or his forgiveness is unconditional, that he will forgive anyone, anytime, anything. And in, in a matter of fact, that is true. However, there is a caveat that we have to put attached to that. And that's, if you're not willing to forgive others, 
God can't forgive you, okay? It's not that he doesn't want to, it's that he's not able to because you haven't started the process. You haven't allowed him to initiate what he wants to do in your life. So that's where we talked about, and we'll have that video up hopefully in the next few weeks if you miss that Sunday. Um, but today we want to move on to the next aspect as we dissect uh, the Lord's Prayer. And that's, do not lead us into temptation. Temptation. Scary word. How many of you think temptation is something that's scary? Interesting. You know, temptation is probably one of the scariest things a Christian will face. However, it's never revealed that way, is it? What is a temptation? A temptation is often something that presents itself as something else. That appeals to your inner desires. It appeals to a seemingly uh, unfulfilled need in your life. So you have something that you think is unfulfilled... And the enemy comes up and he gives a opportunity for that fulfillment to come from another source other than God. Now you will see quickly that every form of temptation that comes our way is designed and directed to lead us to sin. That's the whole point. Satan wants you to sin. Why? Because sin encompasses everything and anything outside of the will of God. As long as you're in the will of God, you're going to be happy, you're going to be fulfilled, you're going to be doing the things you're supposed to be doing. When you're outside of that will of God, then you are open to the attacks of the enemy. And I want to talk a little bit about how the enemy can attack us. In James, well, let's start with this first. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 13, it says... um, Because I want to discuss some things before we get into the meat of the matter here. There's some things that we need to consider, some thoughts that we need to keep at the forefront of our mind whenever we're dealing with temptation. We need to know these things, we need to use them and equip them so that we don't get caught up in, in the enemy's plans and motives. Temptation comes from Satan, not from God. In James 1.13 it says, When tempted, no one should say, God has tempted me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So we need to get this thought out of our head. Usually when we think God's tempting us, we think of it as a trial. God's testing me. Get that thought out of your head. God will never tempt you to do evil. God will never tempt you to sin. It's never, he's not the one dangling the carrot in front of your, your nose saying, Ooh, take a bite, take a bite, take a bite. No, that's not him. He is the farthest from that. He is the exact opposite of that. He does not want you to fall to temptation. He doesn't want you to be uh, confused by it. He doesn't want you to be overtaken by it. The next point is that everyone will be targeted for temptation. In 1 Peter 5.8 it says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. What is the image you get when you think of the devil who goes around looking for someone to devour? Do you think of of some lion that's out there prancing around, picking on a little gazelle, singling them out, and then tearing them to shreds? That's sometimes the image we have, but that's actually not the the full image because uh, Satan is powerless, Okay, a lion has lots of power. But since the cross, Satan has no power over us. He has no authority. You see, at the cross, and and this is a a really cool thing that I I have to flush out. This is something God told me while I was sitting on a beach. You know God speaks to you when you're on a beach? I I need a bigger beach. We need more beaches in Edmonton. That's all I can say. Um... But he he flooded me with this thought. And I I, I can't tell you that I've pushed it out or I've got it all figured out. I'm still working on it. But when God created the earth, he gave all the authority in heaven and earth to Adam and Eve. Remember that? So Adam and Eve had full authority over the earth. What they said, 
happened. They named the animals. They, they did things. They had the authority of it. Excuse me. When, when Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible tells us that the authority on earth was transferred to Satan. Satan then became, uh, as the world describes it, the, the king of the air. Okay? Uh, the master of the earth. He, he took on the authority. He stole it from Adam and Eve. They sinned. They screwed up. They messed up. They gave up their authority here on earth. The cross, Jesus restored that authority. He took it back. He took back the authority from Satan, so Satan no longer has any authority here on earth. But what did Jesus do with that authority? He gave it back to his church. The authority of earth... Who speaks for the earth, he returned back to who he intended it to be for. The original was supposed to be Adam and Eve, mankind. That didn't work out. So when he returned it, he returned it to his bride, the church. So now we have all authority here on earth. What we say happens, happens. What we say go, goes. Who doesn't have authority? Satan. Satan no longer has authority here. And there is only one way that Satan can attack us. And that is through our free will. There is only one way that Satan can bring destruction to us. And that's through our own choices. When he comes, he can't inflict you with a disease. He can't inflict you with sickness. He can't inflict you with all these pains. You know, we like to blame the devil for it, but he doesn't have the authority to do that. He only has the authority to do what we allow him to do. Because the authority is on us as Christians. And if we can get this one simple concept down, if we can get this understanding and put it into practice, we will change this world. We will change the way things operate here when we pick up our authority. Because if you're not using your authority, it just sits there idle and gets abused. But when you stand up and acknowledge your authority, then you can use it for what its purpose is. So we're talking about the authority. We're talking about Satan has no authority. The only way he can get to us is through our own free will. The only weapon he has in his arsenal is temptation. That's the only thing he can do. We notice it at the beginning of time in Adam and Eve when they were in the garden. The only thing he could do was tempt them to sin. That's all he could do. We notice when it came to Job... Yes, Satan was able to do some things to him and do it. This Old Testament, that's when the authority was still his and he still had the ability to do these things. So he inflicted pain and misery on Job. But we also notice that the temptation was there. He was tempting Job to curse God and die. Then if we come to the New Testament where Jesus is here, what was Satan's only weapon he could use against Jesus? temptation after jesus was in the desert for 40 days fasting he was a week as a week could be right i don't know how many of you have ever gone 40 days without food i have not myself but i would think that after 40 days you would probably be pretty pretty weak and he wasn't doing it sitting on a couch okay he did 40 days in the desert how many of you have been in a desert I've been in deserts. I actually like deserts as long as I have air conditioning, right? They're beautiful, but you just need a place to cool off. So Satan attacks Jesus. His attack is in the form of temptation. If Satan attacked Adam and Eve using temptation, if he have attacked Jesus using temptation, how do you think he's going to attack you? Same way. He's going to attack you with temptation because it's his only weapon. It's the only weapon he has in his arsenal is to tempt you to do things of your own free will. The devil cannot hurt you beyond what you enable him to do. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. 
And when you are tempted, he will also provide a way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. Okay? So God has put some parameters on Satan. What he can do and what he can't do. Satan does not have free reign on this earth. There are laws and rules that he has to follow. One of these things is Satan cannot tempt you beyond you what you are able to bear. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty big limiting factor. If you only have one weapon, and the rule of that weapon is that you cannot use it unless and you cannot use it so it's fully effective, okay, you can only use that weapon at 50%. Because if you use it at 60%, it will work. Don't you love God? He's kind of set Satan up and and said, yeah, guess what? Go ahead, attack my people. The only weapon you can use won't work against them. And yet we're fearful. Yet we we realize that sometimes his weapon does work. And why does it work? Because we doubt the word of God. His weapon will work. If you look, let's take a look at Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. I'm going to read that out for you. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast in the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. So Eve, she's right on. She's repeating exactly what God told her there. We can eat from anything in the garden, but we just can't eat from that one tree in the middle. Now this is where the craftiness of Satan comes in. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in that day that you will eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now this is interesting. Did you know that for someone to believe a lie, it has to have some truth put in it? Right? If someone comes and tells you something completely outlandish, you won't believe it. Okay? You just won't. However, if there's a touch of truth to it, then you're more likely to believe it. So what does Satan do here? He tells her a part of the truth. He says... That you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He wasn't lying about that. You see, God knows what's good and God knows what's evil. At that point, Adam and Eve just knew what was good. They didn't know what was evil. When he told them, yeah, guess what? When you eat this, you're going to know what evil is. No, he didn't say it that way, did he? He didn't say, oh, you're going to know what evil is at that point. No, he steps back and says, yeah, you're going to know good and evil. Say it in a nice friendly voice. Make it sound more realistic, more desirable. And then it continues. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, notice the first thing she saw. We have to realize temptation usually always begins with seeing. Okay, When she saw that the tree was good for food, And that it was a delight to her eyes. Temptation will always be a delight to your eyes. It won't be something that, oh, that's not something I want. It's like a fish and a fish hook. What do you use to catch a fish? Something they desire, right? You put a worm on a hook. Or you you put something flashing, something they desire. If you put something on there that the fish doesn't want, they're not going to bite it. So you have to put something on there that entices them. And that's exactly what happened for Eve. It says, and it was delight to her eyes. And that the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from its fruit and ate. And she also gave it to her husband, and with it he ate. Then their eyes, both of them, were opened. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Satan's temptation worked on Adam and Eve. He led them to see something that was desirable. He lessened the consequence 
that God had made. He presented it in a way that they desired it, and then they fell for it. You can probably attest in your own life, because each and every one of us has faced temptation, and I can pretty much guarantee that each and every one of us in here has failed and fallen for the temptation. Can I get an amen? All right, we're all on the same playing field. When we're looking at this, we see that there are certain things that Satan will always do. And if we recognize these things, we will be less likely to fall for his scam. Okay? Anybody like falling for scams? No? You like it when someone takes your money and doesn't give you what they promised? That's fun, right? Oh, we don't like that. Well, that's what happens every time we fall for Satan's temptations is we are falling for his scam. We are falling for because he is presenting something as being great, of good value, of something that's desirable. Then when we get it, we realize we don't really want it. It's a scam. okay? And if we understand temptation is a scam, we're less likely to fall for it. Let's take a look at how Jesus dealt. How did Jesus deal with the temptation? In Matthew 4, we're going to read from verses 1 to 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry. Yeah, I bet. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now, let me ask you a question. Would there be anything wrong with Jesus turning stones into bread? Was anything morally wrong about that? No. It was not a moral issue. He was simply trying to entice him to do something because Jesus was there fasting. Jesus was there giving up something that he had the right to do. He had the right to eat. But he was sacrificing that to get into closer relationship with the Father, to demonstrate to us how we could do it and that you cannot be defeated. And he answered and said, It is written... Say that with me. It is written. If you want to defeat Satan's temptation, you cannot do it with your own cunning, your own devices. You cannot do it with your own thinking. Okay? It's just not possible. Satan is a lot smarter than each one of us. In fact, he's had his demons watching each and every one of us since you were born. He knows everything about you. He knows what will work on you, what won't work on you. And he is continually testing us to see, looking for kinks in our armor, looking for things that will make us fail. And for each one of us, this could be something different. Okay? The temptation says it's common to all. So there are certain characteristics and certain commonalities of temptation. However, each one of us can be tempted in different areas. Something might be tempting for me, but not tempting for you. And vice versa, something could be tempting for you, but to me it's not. So that's why it's important that we recognize in our own lives, what is tempting for me? What is tempting? What are the things? And it is such a huge gambit. He has such an opportunity to cause us to miss the mark because there are so many things we can do that lead us astray from doing. And I'm not talking like huge major sins, okay? I'm not talking about the adultery, which is obviously a sin, but I'm talking about the little things like worry. Wow, is worry a sin? Yes, it is. What about gluttony? Anybody ever been tempted to eat a whole package of cookies? Anybody ever eat a whole package of cookies? Okay. These are all areas that we need to look at. We need to know where are the areas that we're vulnerable and look at it. Okay. So it is written. Say that again. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Okay. Okay. Jesus didn't go back to Satan and said, no, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. No. What did he say? He brought scripture out. Okay. But the interesting thing about this is who was the first one? Who who quotes scripture again here? It's Satan. Okay. Satan knows the Bible. Okay. Sometimes we think if Satan would read the Bible, it'd burn out his eyeballs and he just couldn't do it because it's so holy. No, Satan knows every word of God. 
He was there when God said it. Okay? It's present. He, he's aware of it. But what does he do? He takes it and he distorts it. Okay? How do I say that? Well, look at the second temptation. It says, And the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Okay? Look at the comeback. He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now, let me ask you, is that in the Bible? Yes, it is. Satan is quoting the Bible here. He is saying, it's written. God won't help you. And now Jesus is smarter than the devil. He knows more, and he says this. And Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Okay? So Jesus, again, uses scripture to fight against what the enemy is saying because the only thing that can defeat warped scripture is true scripture okay so then the third time again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory now it's very interesting because if you look in the original language it, it actually mentions time okay so satan not only shows him all the current nations of the earth, but he shows them all the current, the nations or the kingdoms of the earth that are to come as well. So all past, present, and future kingdoms and nations. Uh, very neat thing that our English language misses. And to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you. Now let me ask you the question, were these Satan's to give? Yes, they were. These were under Satan's possession right now. Remember, Adam and Eve gave up authority of the earth when they sinned. They gave up the authority to Satan. Satan, at this time, when he's talking to Jesus, had authority on the earth. He had full authority. He had complete authority. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Now, for some of us, we think, oh, yeah, Jesus, he would never worship the devil, and we move on. But we have to remember what Jesus was at at this point. He fully knew what was going to take place on the cross. He fully knew that it was going to take place in that week where he was going to be rejected, he was going to be scorned, he was going to be beaten, he was going to be brutalated, he was going to have more things done to him physically than any person on the face of the earth would ever face. He knew all that, he saw it coming. Satan was giving him an out. He was saying, I will give you the people of the earth. All you have to do is worship me. This was not some fly-by-night temptation. In my mind, in my thinking, this was a legitimate, full-powered, something that would make your gut wrench. It's like if somebody came in here and said, hey, I'll give you $10 million. All you have to do is renounce your faith. Some of you, that's no temptation at all. Others, that's a big temptation. That authority was there. And what did Jesus do? He said this, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Again, he countered him with Scripture. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Talks about how the angels brought him food. So the fast was now over. Just a few minutes ago, he could have had the opportunity to turn bread or stones into bread, but he didn't do that, and he held out. And now he was being fed by the angels of heaven. You see, whatever Satan is offering you, God is offering you something much better right around the corner. Okay? Remember that. Nothing Satan offers you is better than what God is offering you right around the corner. That's a concept we have to understand. When temptation comes, there's something better that God has in store. Satan is just trying to beat God to the punch. He's trying to get in there and offer you something less than what God wants to give you. And that's exactly what he did with Jesus. And that's exactly what he did, wants to do for, in us. Hebrews 2.18 says, 
For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid who are tempted. When you are tempted to do anything, the first thing you should always, always, always do is I, I call it send up a red flag. Okay? A distress flag. Okay? God, I'm being tempted here. I need your help. Okay? First step always. Because Jesus, because he was tempted, let's read it again. For since he himself was tempted, and that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Jesus is able to come to your aid when you are tempted. Because of what he went through. So the first step is always send up a red flag. Okay? Jesus, I need help here. I'm being tempted. Help me. Okay? James 4, 7 says, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Step two, resist the devil. This is where the rubber really meets the road. Okay, Let's go back to that cooking analogy. Um, somebody bakes some beautiful chocolate chip cookies. You can smell them in the house. They're sitting right on the counter. You want to eat the whole pan. Anybody been there? But you don't have any milk. That's the problem. You resist. Okay? Resist does not mean that you say, I'm not going to do it. 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 Okay? That's how we often think resisting is. That's not what resisting is. Resisting means to replace the thought with something else. Okay? If you were to resist the enemy, if you're going to resist the need to eat that chocolate chip cookie, and I'm sorry for making this trivial, I just, I want to give something that we can all understand here and we can all relate to, is if you resist eating that chocolate chip cookie, instead you replace it and you go and eat an apple. Okay? You replace the action. If you just sit there and keep saying, I'm not going to eat that cookie, I'm not going to eat that cookie, what happens? You're still hungry, right? Right? There's still that message going from your stomach to your head saying, eat something, eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it. And you're saying, I'm not going to eat it, eat it, I'm not going to eat it, eat it. it." And it just goes back and forth. So you have to replace that thought with something else that is good. Okay? And in the cookie analogy, you replace eating the cookie with eating an apple or eating a fruit, eating something like that. That way you're satisfied, your body is nurtured, and yet you don't have to fall to that temptation. Our third point, Matthew 26, 41. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Our flesh is weak. Our spirit wants to do the right thing. There is a battle going on between our flesh and our spirit continuously in our bodies. We need to pray. And this isn't our typical prayer that we're talking about that says, oh, God, I need this, 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 and this. Okay, that's not the type of prayer we're talking about here. Jesus is talking about relational prayer. Because the more you pray, the more your spirit becomes in tune with the spirit of God, the greater your resistance becomes to temptation. The closer you are, it's like, some of you may be able to relate this way. If you've been in a service where the presence of God is just overwhelming on you and you just feel God on every part of your being, is that when you have the thoughts to do something unholy? No, it's not, is it? It's when you're bored. It's when you're alone by yourself somewhere. That's when those thoughts come, those unholy thoughts, those things of doing things that are against the will of God. So the more we strengthen ours, now, and I need to put a little caveat out here, is because the prayer needs to happen prior to the temptation. Okay? Prayer is what builds you up. When you are caught in the temptation, prayer is not as effective. Let me give you an example, and I want to be a little bit brutally open with this. 
um, because it is so prevalent. The, the stats that I've seen, and, and just recently I saw some more stats that just brutalized. Um, this is a real issue that the church has ignored for, for a really long time. And we're going to have to start dealing with it. We're going to have to start talking about it more openly. But it's the whole issue of pornography. Let me ask you a question. I'm giving you the answer already. But what is the number one money-making industry online? It's the pornography industry. In fact, you may think of things like Amazon or eBay or all these different sales things. You may think, whoa, those are pretty big. The fact is, if you join every retailer together, Amazon, um, eBay, all of the big ones, you you join all these big parties together, you add all of their revenue up together, it's not even one-tenth of what the porn industry brings in. It's not even close. And again, why is the pornography industry so successful? It's all about visual, right? Right? How did Satan tempt Eve? Visual. She saw it, it was good. Same thing happens with pornography. It's seeing it, and it's reaching a need, an apparent need that's not being fulfilled, but it's so distorted and so out there that we never even think about it. Now, for people who are caught in pornography, if they have that temptation to act on it, sitting there and praying and praying and praying doesn't make it go away. Because there are indicators that happen beforehand. The prayer is something that needs to take place first so that you resist. And the temptation, you have to look at it as a slippery slope. Okay? Once you start going down the hill of temptation, the longer you wait to respond, the harder it is to deal with. You look when Jesus was dealing with Satan, did he stop there and think about it for a while and say, let me consider my options. Okay, if I bow down and worship you, now how long do I have to sit here and worship you for? Can I just go down for a second and then get back up? Do I have to sit down for two minutes? What do I need to say when I worship you? Do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? And then I get everything that's here. Did Jesus ask any of those questions? Did he try to figure out if there's a way he can make this work? No, he ended it right where it began. And the same thing has to happen with us in temptation. If you're a person who worries, the first time you have a thought of worry, it has to end there. Don't think you can dwell on it for a little while. Don't think you can think about it for a little while and and then Get rid of it later. The first time that thought comes in your head, and this is why it's so critical, because the first thought is not sin. I'll say this. Uh, If you're walking down a street, and women, you can close your ears here, because this is for the men. But if you see a beautiful woman who's scantily dressed, walking by and catches your attention, that is not sin. Looking again at her is sin. The first look is not your fault. It's not your doing. You you can't control her walking into your field of view. However, looking again, yes, you can stop that. It's the same thing. The enemy can put suggestions into your mind. They are not your own thoughts. They are the enemy's thoughts. And when he puts them in, the first time you think it, that cannot be you thinking it. Okay, It's not your thought. But if you continue to dwell on it, then it becomes your thought. So the secret is to stop it as soon as it comes in. Replace it with something else. Charge yourself up beforehand, okay? The the stronger your spirit is, the closer your spirit is to God, the less of an opportunity Satan has to bring temptation into your life. Romans 6, 12 to 14, we're going to end with this. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you may obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body as sin instruments of an unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sh- sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace." You are not under the law. You are under grace. 
Sin shall not have mastery over you. Now, this is a huge plus. If if you're caught in something, and I'm not going to point out anything. This is between you and God. You need to understand that. But if you are caught in some habitual sin, and this is really how the enemy works, because if you have a sin, there's one thing about committing a sin once, but if the enemy sees something works once, he's going to keep influencing you over and over and over to do it. It's like if... How many of you were were watching the Olympics? Nobody was watching the Olympics. Our Canadian women win or got a bronze medal in this four hundred or the four medley. That was awesome. It's like the last time we got a medal, and that was like nineteen ninety six. How many of you remember nineteen ninety six? It was a long time ago. Anyways, they did great. So watch it. It's fun. Um, but I was watching this tennis match, and it was between the Bulgarian and the American. And this Bulgarian found this one move that worked every single time and got her a point. It was the same. She'd serve to the side. The other one would hit it back. She'd tip it in there, and she couldn't get to it. And it was just like clockwork. She did it like seven or eight times. And it almost became funny because if she did the same move, she got a point. Same thing every time. And it just occurred to me at that time, you know what? That's exactly how the enemy works. When he sees something that works in your life, He's going to try to repeat it. When he sees you fall for a scam once, he's going to make you try to fall for it again. Now, how many would you like to fall for the same scam more than once? Anybody like to do that? Is that a fun thing to do? You know, you get taken by one person and then the next day you get taken by another person doing the exact same thing. Sound like a fun thing? Sign me up, right? Of course not. We don't want that to happen. And yet we allow it to happen on a regular basis. We allow Satan to do the exact same trick on us over and over and over again. And we keep falling for it. Why? Because he makes it look good. He makes it appealing to our eyes. Oh, wow. Yeah, I won't go there. That'll offend you too much. But, um... When we're stuck in habitual sin, we have to understand that it's usually a process, okay? There's usually triggers where this trigger will set you to do this, which will trigger this, which will trigger this, which will trigger this. The sooner you learn that set of triggers, the sooner you can cut it off so that you don't go from A, B, C, D. You cut it off at A and you're done with it. This is a neat thing about Satan. If you resist him, he will flee from you. That means if he tries something and it doesn't work... He's going to move on. That doesn't mean he's not going to try it later on to see if you've fallen for it, to see if you let your guard down, to see if you haven't learned enough from it. He's going to try it. But the thing we need to realize is that Satan is limited. Okay? He is not omniscient. He's not omnipotent. God is all-powerful. Satan is not. Satan has a very limited amount of resources. How do we know this? Well, we know that when Satan fell, one-third of the angels came with him. What does that tell you? Two-third of the angels stayed. So that means for every demon, and for those of you who don't know, a demon is just a name for a fallen angel. For every demon there is, there are two angels in heaven to counter him. Okay? Satan is very limited in his resources. And he's also very smart. Uh, I, I... I have dealt with his tactics. I, I've dealt with it, things he's done. And the only way I've been able to defeat it is because the voice of God has told me what's happening. Um, I'll, I'll give you something that might scare you a little bit, but my family's not here, so they won't need to hear it. Um, I don't know how many of you noticed I had beads in my beard. Yeah. I thought they were kind of cool until I got sick. And I got really sick this week. I got very sick. I, I've never been that sick before and as I was sitting there God said you've been cursed I'm like what do you mean I've been cursed when was I cursed and he said when that woman was putting those beads she was cursing you and I'm like God that's not right I didn't sense anything I didn't know anything I guess I was in vacation mode and I didn't know what was going on he said she cursed you with sickness and and the only way for you to break it is for you to take them out and destroy them and then you will be healed. And this was, I was tired. I was out. I'm okay, God. 
I'll take them out. I took them out, left them there. And the next day I woke up, I was still sick. And I'm like, God, you said I'd be better. You, you said that this was going on. How come I'm not better? And he, and he said, you didn't follow all my instructions. I'm like, what do you mean? He said, well, you threw them in the garbage, but I told you to break them. I said, well, should I melt them and burn them? He said, no, I don't want you to burn them. I want you to break them. So this was late at night. I got out of bed, <laughs> went down to my garage, grabbed a pair of pliers, and started snapping every single bead. And every single one of them, as they were breaking, I felt a release. I felt getting better. I felt my energy coming back. And I snapped them, bang, 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 all of 15 of them gone and done. And I went back to bed, woke up, all the signs were gone. My headaches were gone, the fever was gone, all of these things. Now, granted, I'm still recovering. I'm not 100% right now. But it just shows how easy we can let our guard down and things happen. Now, don't be afraid of this because this is not a tactic that will be used on, on you, okay? The enemy does not have the resources. And, and this is the neat thing because I, how many of you would get angry at that person who cursed you and want some vengeance on them? You don't have to raise your hands. I'm, that's, I don't want to know how you act. Um, but this is a spirit that came upon me. I started interceding for this woman. I started praying that the evil that was on her would be broken. I started seeing things in the spirit where this woman was set free, where she was broken of all the demonic that was on her life, and she was now uh, going to go to the true power in God alone. And I'm like, you know what, God? I'm okay with that. If it took me... Uh, going through this misery so that my eyes would be opened enough that I could target my prayers and seeing this woman into freedom, that's worth it for me, okay? These are things that happen. Curses are real. Blessings are real. We all love blessings, right? How many people love blessings? If you don't put up your hand, you don't get one. Oh, come on. I can't say that. Okay? But we all love blessing. But the other side of the coin is curses. Curses exist. They're real. We, do we need to be afraid of them? No. Because no curse can be put on you that God can't break. There's no authority on heaven and earth that is above his authority. Okay? Evil people who are involved in the occult have found a way to tap into the power. Now, they're tapping into the power. They're not tapping into the authority. Okay? Understand that. Power is around. We know how to operate in power. We operate in power in all the, in this church. The one thing that we have that evil does not have is authority. Okay? Because all the authority on earth has been given to who? Us, the church. We have all the authority. We have all the power. They have a little bit of power. That's just to give you an overall understanding of how it works. Why they can do these things is because they're operating under the limited power that they have. But it gets crushed by the authority and the power that we have. As long as we're aware of it. Now, would have I been aware of what happened to me? No, it, it took God speaking to me and saying, this is exactly what happened. He actually showed me the curse that she was putting on me. And I'm like, wow. So she was praying those things she was chanting those things in her mind when she was doing this and I'm like I didn't get any of that while I was there but God showed it to me later on that's why they're gone my family keeps asking me why do you take them out and I'm like do I want to tell them I was cursed no I don't but, so you guys don't tell them either okay and we'll cut that out of the video um, <laughs> but that's just some of the things that are happening I want you to be encouraged I want you to know that you do not have to fall to temptation Okay, send up a flare. God, help me. What's the next step? Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Before all that, your preliminary is prayer. The stronger your spirit is, the weaker your, your flesh will fall towards the enemy, and you can stand firm. So prayer, and then realize that in all this, God wants you to be pure, holy vessels. If you are a pure, holy vessel, number one, you're less attractive to the enemy. He doesn't want to have anything to do with you. Okay? If he can't get past your armor, if he can't get past you and tempt you to do things that will bring destruction to your life, he's going to forget about you and move on to other people. 
Because there's a lot of people in this world that he can affect. And if he can't touch you, he's going to go on. And what does that mean? That means now you're free. You're no longer attacked by the enemy. Um, you're free to fully live the will of God in your life. And, and you will just sense things that you've never sensed before. You will do things you've never done before. You will experience the fullness of his power because you won't feel this resistance. But part of understanding that, the enemy cannot attack you with anything unless you give him authority to do it. Because you have the authority. You have to give up the authority for him to have any. And if we don't do it, then he's got none. So resist the devil and he will flee from you. Amen? God bless you. Have a wonderful, amazing week. And we will see you all next time. (laughs) 